So hi everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, welcome to uh, this edition in April of the uh, Asia Society Roundtable Luncheon. Uh, obviously because of the coronavirus, uh, we're not able to have it as we usually do in the Latte Hotel where we have a lunch conversation and uh, some expert guests and uh, a nice dialogue afterwards, but we're going to uh, make a lemonade out of lemons uh, and we're going to do this virtually using uh, Fuse as the case may be. And uh, we're going to go through a couple of uh, interesting topics today and uh, I have joining me to go over these topics uh, two absolutely stellar experts on the Korean Peninsula uh, in general, especially on the political side. Um, and more generally, uh, Northeast Asia issues uh, covering security and politics uh, and a number of other issues as well. Uh, in particular, I have uh, with me today uh, Juyon Kim, who is a senior advisor for Northeast Asia and uh, nuclear policy at the International Crisis Group, and uh, Dr. Go Myung Hyun, who is a research fellow at the Azan Institute. So uh, I thought that uh, today we would go through uh, three sort of major topics, um, and I hope that uh, these topics will pique your interest and uh, meet your expectations for the high quality dialogue that we usually have uh, at these roundtables. Uh, in the first place, I wanted to go over some South Korea related issues. Uh, obviously, the coronavirus uh, has been dominating the headlines here as in most other places in the world. Uh, and so I want to start off with a little bit of a discussion about that. Uh, the second major thing, in some cases, maybe even you might say the issue that's become even more important uh, over the last week to 10 days has been the recent general election. Uh, we're doing this uh, recording uh, on a Thursday morning uh, right after uh, the election on Wednesday. So the results are in, at least you know from uh, the best we can tell. Uh, and so we're uh, going to be able to talk about a little bit of the aftermath of the general election. And then after that, I want to move on to talk a little bit about some North Korea related issues and then some international political uh, issues, including um, Korea and South Korea relations uh, with uh, the United States uh, and with China in particular. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, pose my first question uh, to Dr. Go, and basically, mm -hmm. can you maybe give us a little bit of a rundown of the state of play? Uh, of South Korea's uh, coronavirus efforts? You know, where are we uh, in terms of the development uh, of uh, this epidemic here, part of the larger global pandemic? Uh, mm. And what do we have uh, coming uh, around the bend? Like what's, uh, what's waiting for us uh, here around the corner in Korea? Yeah, so great. I mean, great question. Uh, I think uh, Korea is, I mean, also we all know, has been very successful in, in doing the so-called flattening the curve. I mean, right now, the daily number of new infections, uh, the number of cases is down to uh, like uh, less than 100 or some day, you know, bad days are about 100, but in most days actually below 100. So this is actually a very successful case compared to you know many other countries right now. And, and the part of the reason is because Korea has entered this curve way early in the game. I mean, Korea is located very close to China. And uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, visits going back and forth between the two countries. So Korea suffered from the COVID-19 pandemic from the get-go, but because Korea has implemented this uh, novel strategy of when people call it the right strategy of uh, testing and tracking as many infect infected cases as possible, I think uh, you know, Korea has been very successful in uh, going after uh, the COVID-19 uh, infected population and isolating them and and treating them if necessary. And I think we are seeing that uh, we are in, at a phase where uh, you now we have to start talking about how to return to normality. And that's, uh, I think that's remarkable. Great, thanks a lot. Dion, when do you think we're gonna move back to whatever the new normal is going to be? What's the timeline for that? Or what are the markers you might say that would, would let us move that way? To move back to the new normal or to Continue. Whatever, whatever the new normal is going to be, like what what are the timeline or the markers that are going to take us, you know, you know, past let's call it the crisis phase, and into whatever the new normal is going to be like. You know, I, I think that's hard to tell, but it almost looks like, at least for those in South Korea, perhaps people here are already beginning a new normal life. Uh, because nobody knows how long this pandemic will last. And even if South Korea's situation gets better, uh, 
perhaps even if the epidemic here subsides, uh, South Korea and no other country will actually be safe uh, until all countries or most countries are safe, meaning until you know there is a vaccine for everyone. And so, uh, I, you know, I I I don't think. Well, I mean, I'm not an expert in infectious disease and, and economics, but uh, it almost seems like uh, at least based on those I've talked to here in South Korea, it sounds like people are um, have accepted uh, more or less that uh, this different type of this different way of living is here to stay for quite a while. So, you know, that's basically what I would say for now. Also, okay. the rejoinder, if you allow me, is that uh, there's a case of uh, Singapore. I think uh, Duyan is actually pointing out uh, uh, that, you know, it's too soon, so to speak, uh, in a way to go back to the normality that uh, we used to know, uh, if uh, we are allowed to you know, put in that uh, way. Uh, because Singapore reopened the schools a couple of weeks ago, and but then they rolled back the measure right away because they saw that the new cluster of you know COVID-19 infections start popping up at schools this, uh, this time around. So right now, Korea is you know, thinking about uh, restarting, I mean, reopening the schools, you know, but I think they are, I mean, the, the government is, uh, has very much back of their minds what's going on in Singapore. And I think they're going to be more cautious than expected because of that. And so as Duyan has pointed out, uh, going back to normal, you know, the, the normal daily life that we used to know would, might take longer than we expected. But then I think uh, what I'm, uh, I think the government will try to take the first tentative steps towards that direction, right? And now from now because the election has uh, been, I mean, this done. And I think uh, government is also concerned about the economic uh, fall, uh, fallout of the you know, social distancing measures, extreme social distancing measures. So I think, uh, you know, there are two competing uh, factors here. One is the government's, uh, you know, uh, sense of caution that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is a very novel disease. And we don't know whether, you know, people who, I mean, whether it's going to make a comeback or not. Uh, but at the same time, this is pressing need to return to normality for economic reasons mainly. Yeah, I, I can pose this question to both of you. Um, you know, what do you think the economic fallout is going to be here? Um, you know, both in terms of budgetary, uh, mm -hmm. budgetary line, but also in terms of you know production, you know, declines, GDP declines. You know, how mm -hmm. big a hit are we talking about here? It might be a bit difficult to tell because. We don't know exactly how big the hit is going to be, you know, in China or in the U.S. and, and in, in Europe and other major trading partners. But, you know, how big a hit are we looking at here? Are we looking at something that we're going to get out of the public health crisis and we're going to immediately jump into a massive economic crisis? Or do you think it's possible for us to, to weather both of those storms? No, I think uh, you're totally right. I think uh, your, you know, the last line is perfect. I mean, we want to jump right from a public health crisis to the economic crisis. Uh, the newest number that came out was from the International Monetary Fund, and the IMF uh, has uh, forecasted that South Korea is going to experience negative growth this year. And I mean, that's actually a you know a forecast that's way low, way down from our earlier forecast, which uh, you know said that. Uh, South Korea might enjoy uh, still a positive growth this year. And that is the reason why IMF uh, you know, uh, uh, and essentially adjusted down the forecast is because I think the cool down or like the recession going on globally right now is, uh, uh, is apparently in much larger scale than one had expected before. And the reason, and then we know that South Korean economy uh, is heavily dependent on exports and and they actually export over big ticket items such as automobiles and the big, uh, you know, transportation ships and you know, ga uh, gas tankers and all that. I think all these demands are going to dry up. So only bright spot is going to be the IT sector. But then even that, it might, you know, suffer from the repercussions of the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think even though South Korean economy looks good so far, because uh, I mean, I think uh, South Korea clearly had a less of, uh, less of an impact from the uh, pandemic. And and as people, you know, we impose the less of a social distancing measure compared to other countries. But because South Korea is more dependent on the global economy than uh, other countries, I think we are going to. I mean, we are essentially should be uh, waiting. I mean, like uh, ready for a major, major dry up, but dry up of the export uh, in the coming month, and that's going to affect the economy uh, more disproportionately compared to other countries. 
Yeah, I would echo everything that uh, Myung-hyun said. And just to add um, the a more, I guess, policy and political dimension to this picture is uh, in that, you know, in two years, South Korea will hold its uh, presidential elections. And of course, the economy will top the agenda and on the minds of voters. Uh, and so I think we can expect to see um, political parties, you know, on the one side, of course, the progressives will play up how well they did with coronavirus, and we can expect them to blame the pandemic for South Korea's economic struggles. And at the same, on the other hand, I think we can expect uh, the opposition to try to highlight that South Korea's economic struggles predated uh, the pandemic. And so I think we'll continue to see this um, debate and this battle on the political front. Uh, and so, you know, as you know, as everybody here knows very well that um, in any presidential election, uh, the economy is um, one of the top uh, topics uh, for voters. And so we'll have to see, you know, how how well or how the Moon government is able to uh, either prevent uh, South Korea's economy from diving or uh, try to even bring it to a more recovery and upward trends. Uh, we'll have to see how they, they're able to manage that and then see what the debate and the discussion is like from that. Great. Thanks a lot to both of you on that. You know, I, I just heard, you know, Juyan slip in the watchword here that I think sort of helps us transition to the next topic, and that's the term elections. Um, so I think we're, we're ready to move on to that. I, th I think just from my perspective, you know, I'll, I'll say sort of two things that are anecdotal. And of course, you know, data, you know, is not the plural of anecdote. But I'm not sure how valuable this piece of information is or this, this you know, experience that I have is. But, you know, as a you know, as a parent of, of two young children who aren't in school right now, I certainly hope that we get back to school quickly. And, you know, I'm not the only person. You know, obviously, you know, when we talk about the economic consequences, you know, we, we probably think mostly about, you know, export real industries, but, or perhaps, you know, things like tourism where you, you, you can't make up for, for the lost business. I mean, you can't stockpile unused, you know, hotel rooms and then, you know, roll them out later. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, but, you know, as someone who has the privilege to be able to work at home, unlike a lot of other people, uh, I'm acutely aware of that privilege, while at the same time, I also realize how much productivity I lose. And so, you know, it may be harder to 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 guess about what that productivity loss is going to be. But there are a lot of people who are working from home who are, you know, 50, 60 percent as productive as they used to be, even though technically, you know, they haven't been laid off or had their hours reduced or anything mm -hmm. else. So. Um, I think that's that's one thing. And second thing is just anecdotally talking about returning to the new normal. You know, I was out a couple of nights ago beginning to, to test the new less uh, aggressive social distancing ethos here. And I have to say the world certainly looked like a normal place. The bars were full. The people were out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the warm weather came. And I think some people were like, all right, enough of the social distancing. We're ready to go back to, to living a normal life. So. Uh, it will be interesting, I think, to see how South Korea handles a potential second set of clusters and ways, whether they come from schools or whether they come from from other uh, organized events or just, you know, people beginning to to reduce their um, reduce their social distancing um, uh, obligations. Uh, so moving on to the elections. Um, so we're we're here, you know, uh, right after the uh, the general election. Uh, Dion, why don't you give us your hot take on uh, the results from Wednesday? So, you know, clearly the progressives and the ruling party won this election. And, you know, I know there are a lot of commentators out there who will all, who will say it was expected. Um, I would generally agree, but I would caveat that statement by saying, actually, if it were not or the coronavirus pandemic, I think the progressives would, might have had a tighter race, a, a harder race, uh, because, you know, as I mentioned briefly before, that before the South Korea's outbreak um, hit, uh, you know, Moon was being, was battling various um, criticisms and accusations, uh, especially, you know, to, just to name a couple um, big ones are, you know, the economy, uh, welfare, but also um, his and his party's um, push to 
to to implement several reforms, like on you know judicial reforms, electoral reforms, uh, and prosecutorial reforms. And then uh, Moon's closest aides were also embroiled in scandals, and so corruption scandals and accusations. And so um, that was the scene going into these elections before the outbreak. Uh, and so, you know, during the campaign, you had the progressives play up uh, Moon's handling of coronavirus, while you had the opposition uh, trying to point out that um, giving credit to the Korean CDC and South Korean uh, health professionals on the front lines and giving credit to South Koreans, the public, the people for largely adhering to or generally adhering to health guidelines. And so, uh, you know, I, I, this is interesting, I think, if we just take a little step back, uh, what this tells other world leaders as they prepare for their own elections. And um, if an argument could be made uh, that how a leader or how political leaders uh, respond to their own epidemics could determine their political fortunes. Great, thanks. Dr. Go. What's your take? Yeah. How do you, how yeah, do you interpret think, yeah. the of the election? What does it tell us about the state of South Korea? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I totally agree with Duyan's point that, uh, you know, the government's handling of the COVID-19 crisis was a major element in helping the ruling party to, you know, have this uh, stunning election outcome. I mean, so overwhelming. It's so much so that uh, uh, it, you know, it's unbelievable to see the numbers. I mean, out of the 300 seats at play, uh, you know, the opposition party, the conservative party, only won like 100 or 103, maybe 107, because we have to add the uh, four independents who are, you know, conservatives, but haven't been known by their own party, but they nonetheless won in their respective districts. So, like, this is like, this number is the lowest that the conservative party has ever won since the return of the democracy in 1987. So it, in fact, this number is lower than uh, you know, the last time that the Conservative Party received a dropping in the elections, which was in, uh, in the aftermath of the, the impeachment of the former president, No Mu Yeon, uh, back in 2004. And then back then, people thought that that would be the bottom of the Conservative Party's mm -hmm. electoral uh, you know, like a fate. But this time, uh, you know, the Conservative Party, Party has been able to, I mean, essentially went under that number. So I think this indicates that, uh, I mean, this, you know, in addition to you know, government's excellent handling of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, I think you know, it says a lot about what's going on in the South Korean society. I think uh, what we have seen this time is actually the continuation of the aftershock of uh, the impeachment of President Park Geun-hye back in 2017. I mean, now it's 2020, but then the, the composition of the political landscape is uh, predates the uh, impeachment of President Park. Uh, it's very, very much the holdover from the pre-impeachment era. And essentially, the electorate has said that, no, this is no longer possible. I mean, we don't like the conservative agenda anymore. We don't like the faces that we know from the conservative side. We need new faces. And I think that's what they have said, because uh, the marginal victory is so huge, This uh, even taking into account the, the handling of the COVID-19 by the government. And I think it's because the people are basically saying no to the conservative agenda of, uh, you know, like I would say, uh, just focusing on the and you know, like, uh, essentially attacking, like you know, staging personal attacks against the government figures, and as well as you know, just focusing on the political aspect of this. I think people are very much concerned about the future of the economy and their own uh, living standards. Uh, for instance, when the government, uh, in the and uh, as a part of uh, handling the economic fallout from the pandemic, they, they try to issue essentially call, you know imitate copy what's going on elsewhere and give like cut a personal check. To you know, voters to help them with the you know handling with the you know, economic fallout because of the you know the social distancing measures. Uh, you know the major opinion coming out of the conservative side wasn't one of a, a positive message. It's actually uh, they essentially were they are more worried about about the you know, populist uh, message in the checking and you know, cutting a personal check to the individual voters rather than you know looking into the personal situation, the dire personal situation of the some of the uh, you know members of the Korean public that they are undergoing right now because of the pandemic. So I think this lack of empathy on the part of the conservatives uh, has really sent a negative message, negative signal uh, to the electorate and then the electorate responded by essentially kicking them out of the office. So this is very shocking because the election, as Duyan had pointed out, 
was supposed to serve as a referendum on the you know President Moon's uh, mistakes, such as pushing you know pushing with the you know the prosecut I mean judicial reform, which was wasn't that popular, uh, given the fact that thousands of Korean people turned out you know, against uh, you know the judicial reform and especially uh, protesting against uh, you know the mini justice former justice minister uh, appointment of uh, former justice uh, former justice minister Jo Guk, and and also there's a lot of uh, you know. Complain. I mean, like, uh, I mean, criticism about government's handling of the economy uh, with the very, you know, rapid uh, increase in the minimum wage, and lastly, with the, you know, essentially a, a de facto failure of the President Moon's signature policy of inter-Korean engagement because of North Korea's, you know, essentially, uh, you know, negative comments coming out of North Korea at the time and their lack of a response to uh, President Moon's gestures. So all this should have been amounted to uh, to make this election a referendum on President Moon's, uh, you know, actions in the last three years. But instead, the referendum has become a uh, you know, referendum on the on the opposition party. And I think it says a lot about the lack of, uh, I was thinking, political touch on the part of the you know current crop of a political and uh, conservative political leaders. Yeah, I, I really agree with you about the fact that this became not only a referendum about Moon's performance or, or the, you know, the Blue House's mm -hmm. performance on, on COVID-19, but also about the conservatives. And you know, they still have this, you know, reactionary rear guard group of people who still think that, you know, Park and Hay's, you know, impeachment was illegitimate. And you exactly. know, they, these people are just a huge millstone around, uh, around the conservative party. And so I actually think in some ways that's the bigger concern for, you know, the Korean body politic going forward. You know, you need a, a competent opposition in order to keep your ruling party uh, in check. You know, you want that type of, you know, uh, check on, on authority. And, you know, I think they have time to get it together. And, you know, they've got, you know, two years before the, the next presidential election. So they have time to get it together, but I'm certainly not com you know, confident in their ability to do so. They haven't used the period. Absolutely agree, yeah. You know, they haven't used the time since Moon came into office to get their house in order. And I think that's a, a pretty big worry. Yeah. That said, two yeah. years is a long time. You know, when I think back to, uh, when I think back to 1990, 1991, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union was, falling apart and dissolving and the United States uh, had just won a massive victory over Iraq. Everyone believed that George W. The, George w. So the, the first George Bush uh, <laughs> would be elected, right? And yeah. then one small recession later and he's out of office as a one-term president and Bill Clinton yeah. comes in. So mm -hmm. you know, two years is a lot of time. And you know, if Moon is selling himself as a, a as a you know public health wartime president, um, you know that's probably good enough, you know, or obviously good enough to to get his party into mm. uh, a massive landslide victory in the general election. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you know people in two years are going to continue to thank him for that. You know, there's a lot of uh, a sense where the 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 voting public says, "What have you done for me lately?" So I think he is going to have to perform. And mm -hmm. especially if the conservatives manage to get their house a little bit in order. Let me ask you this, Duyan. Um, was, was there any race in the general election that had uh, something particularly interesting or spicy about it, whether that be the, the actual race itself or the outcome, either something that was surprising or, or something that um, you know, maybe serves as a bellwether for the future or something from which we can draw a particular lesson? Were there any particular races that were interesting to you? Uh, so for me, um, you know, what was interesting were two points that I can just think off the top of my head where uh, the, the key battleground uh, was the broader, the, the capital area, which includes the Seoul metropolitan area and uh, Gyeonggi and Incheon. Uh, when typically or traditionally in the past, you know, in South Korea, regionalism and the battles between the regions is, is very fierce. Um, outside of the capital area. And so, and, and we saw that the political parties were focusing on the capital area too. Um, the other interesting thing, phenomenon for me to notice was in the individual races, in the individual um, 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 constituency races, uh, some of the, um, I guess, for the lack of a better word, the, the old boys or the old timers, you know, the, the, the faces that 
Koreans are uh, know very well and are accustomed to, they did not win in their specific di districts, few of them. Uh, and so I think this goes back to the point that Myung-hyun and you may see both said about South Koreans wanting new faces, whether you're progressive or conservative. Um, it, 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 told, it said to me that South Koreans do want change. Uh, and so that was one indicator. Okay, great. Dr. Goh, any, any cases, any particular races that you found interesting or that, you know, so one thing about, about yeah, sure. school knowledge or, or, you know, something is a bellwether for the future or, or something just particularly spicy and interesting about it? Well, clearly the, the most important race, or at least the, the most, uh, the race in which, like, to which, like, the most attention was paid to was the race on the district of Chongno, uh, in Seoul, yeah. or in the, where yeah. Ina Gyeon was, uh, the former prime minister ran against the head of the opposition party, uh, uh Hwang Gyo Wan, and, and, uh, you know, Ina Gyeon absolutely had, a uh, you know, landslide. And, uh, and I think that's an indication of what's going to come up in two years' time, unless the opposition changes. And also, what uh, you know, overall, you know, if you look at the overall like a landscape of the races taking place in different parts of the country, except for the you know uh, south uh, south southeastern region, the Daegu, Gyeongbuk, Gyeongnam region, uh, in other areas, uh, if, I mean, the only conservatives who came back happened to be uh, not from the Park, uh, former President Park's faction. They uh, they represent the moral reformist face of the opposition of the conservative uh, political force. So I think uh, that's a message, that's a clear message being sent out that the uh, people have essentially repudiated the Park Geun-hye administration and uh, you know the President Park, and they want a uh, fresh new start for the conservatives, even for the conservative source. I think uh, that should be a major takeaway from uh, this election. But then again, the you know, body politics is uh, different anymore, and they might go in a different direction. And what I'm concerned about is that uh, the four uh, independents who came back, by the way, independent candidates in this election, they all essentially got absolutely got killed. Uh, you know, all the major parties came back, and essentially, South Korea has become a two-party system. Uh, so all the, you know, the remaining like uh, smaller parties have, dis have essentially disappeared. And so, the, but then when it comes to the independents who came back, they all happen to be the old boys from the, you know, old, uh, the, from the opposition party. And I think that they're going to get back to have a position of influence again. And then the concern is that, you know, they didn't learn the, uh, the lesson from this election and they might stick to the old ways again. And that means that in two years time, we are going to see another policy president from the Minju party. All right. Thanks a lot. Very interesting. Um, super analysis. I really appreciate that. Let's move on briefly to uh, to North Korea. Uh, they just had the uh, Supreme People's Assembly. They're what mm -hmm. most people call you know rubber stamp uh, national legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, any takeaways from uh, the this year's SPA? We shall first change it to to mention North uh, North Korea after what happened in South Korea because usually we talk about North Korea first. Uh, so that's very good. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, you know again I think North Korea is hunkering down a little bit because of the COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, and I think uh, what happened uh, over the weekend with the you know uh, in the statement came out that came out of the Supreme uh, People's Assembly. Uh, you know uh, I think that's actually a reflection of the North Korean leadership's concern about the spread of the COVID-19 in the country, even though officially the number of COVID-19 cases in North Korea is zero. Uh, what contradicts that uh, is the fact that Kim Jong-un himself made a mention of the COVID-19 and said that uh, uh, it's a top priority for the regime. Uh, so I think that there's a, a very serious significant spread of COVID-19, just that the uh, North Korean regime that is not uh, equipped to handle the crisis because I don't think they have even the, the basics to tell whether uh, a person who displays symptoms of COVID-19 are indeed infected with COVID-19 or not. So I think a North Korean regime is very aware of that. And so I think, uh, you know, going back to the Supreme uh, People's Assembly, uh, Assembly meeting, I think that reflected a concern. I think that they rubber stamped the decision made uh, earlier in the state council meeting. Uh, where you know Kim Jong Un's remark about COVID-19 came out, and so that's, why, that's the reason why they played up the the uh, the fact that uh, this year North Korea is going to spend more money on the uh, you know public health, uh, which is I mean the budget in North Korea is not really an indication of uh, the true spending allocations in the country, but it's significant that uh, you know the North Korean regime is mentioning about public health because. Uh, I mean, you know, we know that the North Koreans, you know, put priority on national defense and all that. But then this time around, you know, uh, with 
along with the, this announcement, you know, the fact that you know, Kim Jong Un showed up at the, you know, at the, you know, the, what do you call it, the groundbreaking ceremony for the brand new hospital in Pyongyang area. I think you know, the regime as a whole city is trying to project this image that they are paying attention to what's going on in the country, especially in the public health front. And that's actually very quite refreshing. I mean, it's very different from uh, what you know, North Korean regime did regarding the situation in the uh, in the society. You, they usually used to just ignore what's going on inside the country, but now Kim Jong Un is trying to differentiate in a, in a way from his predecessors by you know, paying attention. I mean, at least like, uh, trying to project this idea that uh, this image that he's paying attention to what's going on with the people in North Korea. Great. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I echo what Myung-yeon just said. And just to add um, other components, uh, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see how this affects, how uh, COVID-19 affects the North Korean economy and in turn how that affects uh, Kim Jong-un's policy choices writ large going forward. In other words, uh, you know, we saw his New Year's plans, his plans for 2020 uh, announced last December. Uh, and, you know, they, the North Koreans have since then, every meeting, every action has been to solidify and implement those marching orders. And what we saw back then was an announcement to basically reinvigorate uh, the Pyongyang strategic line of dual economic and nuclear development. But in light of COVID-19, I'd be interested to see if that causes or prompts Kim Jong-un to have to choose one of the two tracks uh, to place more emphasis on. So for example, uh, his father, Kim Jong-il, he threw his weight behind a national defense at the expense of the North Korean economy and North Koreans, the people's welfare. And so, so I don't know, I mean, Kim Jong-un seems uh, so far and during his rule seems he, he uh, wants to put equal emphasis on both tracks, but uh, we'll have to see what kind of twist the coronavirus um, gives to Kim Jong-un's thinking in terms of his calculus. But in the near term, I think we can um, expect to see North Korea continue to try to achieve its economic objectives as best they can under the current circumstances of coronavirus, and also to um, you know, try to achieve their strategic objectives with uh, just as much fervor as we've already been seeing with um, the uh, several rounds of missile testing in March. And you know, I think we can expect to see more of that uh, going forward, the types of missile systems uh, and weapon systems that are perhaps um, just under uh, President Donald Trump's red lines of uh, long range missiles and uh, nuclear devices. I'll, co I'll come back well, to the US in just a second, because yeah. I obviously would like to get to, you know, at least, at least play some Perf, you know, give some perfunctory attention to whatever the diplomatic process is that's currently floundering. But, um, you know, I, I'll just say two things, I guess, you know, that, that struck me about, you know, the last week in North Korea. Um, and the first of which, uh, admittedly, I'm actually getting from someone else, but I thought it was a really interesting point. I don't know how many, I don't know if you, if either of you have looked at, um, Aiden Fossinger Carter's uh, reading of the report on the SPA, but he had an interesting point towards the end where he said, if you if you read through it, there's uh, an element of self criticism of the party, which he said is highly unusual. He said he couldn't remember ever having seen it put quite this way before, where there was a line, the the basic version of which, if I remember correctly, was something like. Uh, there were some problems problems in budgetary execution this year, talking about 2019. And he said that was really interesting because, you know, in read in the context of the, the rest of the report that came out of North Korea about the SPA, it seemed to indicate that they were having trouble collecting revenue, that essentially they had, you know, they had promised X and, you know, were going to ex you know, make expenditures of X, but weren't able to execute that within the budget because they weren't able to gather the revenues, which might say something interesting about the way that sanctions are working. And of course, this was also pre-coronavirus, right? Because this was dealing with 2019. So it'll be interesting, I think, to see, uh, you know, how much the border shutdown with China has affected, uh, you know, the overall, you know, economy, 
and in particular, of course, the state-based economy, because that's officially mm. where the tax revenues come from. But of course, they have an entire sideline of revenue which flows into the government through through the markets. And so it would be interesting to see how many of those markets have struggled so much that they're unable to kick something up into the party uh, and, and higher up into the regime. The second thing, um, you know, there there seem to be some reports coming out that Kim Jong Un uh, wasn't present at the commemoration uh, for the Day of the Sun on the fifteenth, uh, which I think is the first time that that was the case. And there even seems to be some confusion about whether or not he actually sent a a, a flower arrangement. Uh, is does that indicate if that's true? Is that indicative of anything, or is that just? Pyongyangology, and we should just wait to figure out later whether or not that means something. Well, I think uh, I mean uh, I'll first uh, address the last question first. I, I think I I think it's your Pyongyangology. I mean we're reading too much into it because uh, I mean there's an indication that uh, Kim Jong Un has lost uh, uh, has actually less of control over the regime or that or whether he's even sick because of the uh, coronavirus. This is an indication was terrible because he was totally fine last week. So I think uh, the probably is because of some missing information that then also, the, I mean, in order to, I mean, we have to wait a little bit more to get more information coming out of uh, Pyongyang in order to, you know, judge whether, you know, what was just mentioned about the you know, lack of flower or lack of, you know, Kim Jong's presence at the commemoration has any meaning. So having said that, uh, I think uh, the economic situation, I think uh, it's actually very grave in North Korea. I mean, uh, because of the first, uh, I think when it comes to co uh, COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 on the North Korean economy it has two dimensions. One is the the short, I mean, actually two aspects, I guess. One is the short-term impact of the COVID-19, and the other one is the long-term impact of COVID-19. And I think the short-term impact, is, uh, I think it was seen because of the border closure that took place earlier this year, when the first uh, case of COVID-19 started popping up in the in China. And I think what North Korea did was they shut down the border right away because not so much because you know they are really paying in attuned to what's going on in China, uh, but because the legacy of uh, Kim, Kim Il Sung era. I mean, Kim Il Sung has decreed that uh, you know socialist medicine is a preventive medicine, and uh, you know whenever there's a news of like uh, some pandemic looming on the world horizon, North Korea takes action right away, not based on scientific reason, but because of ideological reason. But I guess this time around was a uh, point in the right direction. But I think what North Korea didn't take into account was how dependent North Korean economy has become, especially the Jagmadan system has become on the, uh, the Chinese trade. And I think they noticed that when they shut down the trade, uh, shut down the border, and that stopped the influx of a key commodities into the uh, North Korean Jagmadan market system. And we could see that actually from the data. I mean, Daily NK uh, compiles uh, semi-weekly kind of uh, information about prices in Jangmadang in three different locations in North Korea, uh, one in Pyongyang, the other in Shiniju, just across the river uh, from China. Uh, and then there's also uh, Heju, which is the, to the eastern side of the country. Uh, so also in the border region with China. So the prices in there all shoot up right after the border closure. But uh, then uh, three weeks later, it came down. I mean, it's still higher than before, but still came down a great deal. So. I think it's an indication that the North Korean regime realized that this extreme border closure measure messed up with their economy. I mean, unlike what happened last time they uh, closed the border because of the public health reasons, which was back in 2015, because of the Ebola pandemic, this time around the Jiangmadan system has become a lot more sensitive to this kind of a political measure action taken by the regime. And I think the North, it shows that the North Korean uh, economic system is a, a lot more dependent on the Chinese economy than compared to even three years ago. I mean, if you really want to read too much into this. Uh, so I think uh, that's a, you know indication that North Korean economy is weakness uh, right now. But on, on, the, on the wrong run, this also implies that uh, North Korea will be have a difficult time uh, and you know, overcoming the impact of the sanctions on their economy. The main way through which the sanctions have an impact on the North Korean economy is by reducing the inflow of foreign currency into, the, into their system. And you know, North Korean economy, Despite the fact that they claim to be true chain or that, or self-sufficient and everything, they actually depend heavily on the foreign trade and the foreign, uh, you know, foreign income earnings. So because of sanctions, that has actually essentially prevented North Korea from exporting or earning service income by sending workers abroad. It has reduced their, you know, foreign uh, currency earning a great deal. And one way the Kim Jong Un tried to overcome that was by attracting Chinese tourism. And one of the major uh, 
event or milestone that uh, North uh, Kim Jong was preparing for for this month in April was the opening of the One San Karma tourism project, which is a huge, a uh, major uh, you know resort complex that's being built uh, in One San area, and then. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, North Korea spent upward of six hundred million dollars to build up uh, the resort, which is a huge amount of money for them. So the whole reason why they are preparing spend, uh, that, you know, that resort and also spending that much money was because they wanted to attract Chinese tourism and and in, in order to replace all the earnings loss because of the sanctions. And now because of COVID nineteen, that's going to be, uh, that's not going to be possible, and for the foreseeable future. So. I think uh, you know North Korean with the SPA announcement and then adding other indications show that the Kim Jong Un is preparing the North Korean society for you know for the you know the disaster that's looming over the horizon. And I, I think uh, you know the, I mean you know the, this uh, announcement that uh, the sign of humbleness, uh, humility coming from the regime by acknowledging the problems with budgetary restraints and that. I think it's a message uh, from the government telling the people that they should be ready to tighten the belt. You know we are being humble to you guys. But this is the true uh, picture of what's going on with their economy, with their finance. So you know, respect, uh, respect, uh, uh, expect a lot more harder time coming in the in the future. So get ready for that. So I think uh, that's going to affect their overall strategy with the outside world. Uh, I believe the North Koreans were preparing with the, you know even before the COVID nineteen struck, were preparing to uh, and you know raise the ante when it comes to negotiation with the United States. They are preparing for that time when they will make the final decision with the new pass and all that, uh, which was postponed from the Christmas time last year. Uh, you know, and I think I, I the only occasion showed that the North Koreans were like ramping up their provocations, level of provocations to prepare for that was a major provocation. But because of COVID nineteen with the ensuing economic like a crisis, I think they are trying to postpone that a little bit. So. And then at the same time, they'll have to, you know, uh, think about, uh, you know, resetting their relationship with other countries in the region, mainly South Korea, because if, you know, this thing with, the, you know, this like a new path thing doesn't come, uh, doesn't work out either with China or with the, with the United States, they need an insurance policy, and that's where South Korea comes handy. And I think the earlier indication of that is the the, the letter that the you know, Kim Jong Un's personal letter that Kim Jong Un sent to President Moon, uh, you know, uh, like last month, uh, you know, talking about you know COVID nineteen without really explicitly asking President Moon for help. So I think that is an indication that the North Koreans are at least preparing a stage to you know change the direction of their strategy. They come you know roll back those action later because it's being very tentative right now, very careful. But I think that they're preparing the stage nonetheless. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you expect uh, in terms of um, you know the possibility of uh, U.S. North Korea negotiations this year? So I think uh, you know the prospect uh, of positive outcome from the negotiation is wholly dependent upon the prospect of a President Trump's re-election coming this coming November. If the President Trump is clearly known to get re-elected, then I think the North Koreans are going to say, "Look, you know, we're going to cut our losses. Let's prepare the negotiation for the." Incoming U.S. administration, Peter, Bi uh, Peter Biden, uh, Biden probably, uh, if there's a you know, if it, obviously if Trump loses the election, uh, so that means that North Korea will have to you know send a big send off farewell to uh, President Trump by launching a, a major provocation. I mean, I don't think it's going to be an ICBM, but probably an IRBM. I mean, you know, launched in a very provocative manner, maybe across uh, Japanese airspace. So. I think uh, that's how they're going to, you know, do their send off to President Trump. If you know they sense that President Trump's uh, electoral, you know, prospect is dimming fast because of the COVID-19 crisis. So, but if they just judge that you know, President Trump is going to get reelected no matter what, then they're going to be very careful, and they're going to then uh, send a more conciliatory message to Washington, but also to Seoul as well. So. But this, this all depends on the, you know, on the how the COVID-19 uh, plays out in the U.S. Uh, politics. And then I think North Koreans face certain uncertainty regarding the election because of this, because they don't have enough information, first of all, about uh, uh, what's going on in the United States right now. And at the same time, they are also, you know, they are kind of uh, pushed to the back because, you know, they don't have uh, that many cards left on their table. Uh, because they have spent all their you know, smaller cars, you know, you know, to uh, maintain the moment of provocation. So only car they have left with is the major provocation they've been, uh, you know, like uh, threatening with since the uh, end of last year. So that's a too big though. I mean, that can play, you know, get that can, you know, the upside, downside to that is that that can get play, uh, 
that can you know really uh essentially like a provoke President Trump to like retaliate him literally and the North Koreans don't want to do that, don't want that to happen. So in that sense, I think the North Koreans have a, re a very few options left. So I think this is a certainty combined with the fact that they don't have a dom dom uh, only one option left. I think that means they're going to restrain themselves in the, in the, in the medium term at least. Great. Duyan, I want to pivot real quick to the U.S. Is the U.S.-South Korea alliance an existential threat? whether that be because of Trump's behavior or mixed feelings from the current ruling party or because of the SMA negotiations or opcon transfer, what's, what's the status and prognosis for the U.S. Rock Alliance at the moment? Uh, I think all of the above factors are definitely straining and putting tension in the alliance. Uh, and so, you know, you definitely have the Trump factor and the, the, the so-called Trump factor that South Koreans are frustrated with and upset about uh, is not just it, it has no boundaries political boundaries the conservatives and the progressives are very much they feel insulted actually by trump's um, exorbitant price hike demands for hosting for south korea hosting u.s troops on the peninsula um, they're upset that um, you know that trump then suddenly had called moon to ask for medical supplies and masks during coronavirus and so they basically see trump as um, a bully and, and and extremely insulting to South Koreans and to the alliance. Uh, and then you also have, you know, the fundamental issues of uh, the Moon administration and the Trump administration being, um, you know, having uh, clear differences in their approach to North Korea. And so with the win, with the progressives winning this uh, yesterday in the elections, I think uh, it would, it will embolden uh, Moon to um, be bolder in his foreign policies, perhaps even take more risk. Uh, and that might mean that maybe he'll become bolder when it comes to relations with the United States, especially when it comes to South Korea's relationship with Japan. And so, uh, you know, perhaps the Moon administration will now decide to finally terminate uh, the intelligence sharing agreement, GSOMIA, with, uh, with Tokyo without waiting too much longer. Perhaps it means that uh, the Moon administration will try to um, stick it out and not uh, concede to uh, the Trump administration's demands on, on defense cost sharing. Uh, I, you know, something that keeps ringing in my mind uh, is President Moon, when he was candidate during his presidential campaign, he said to his constituents that he will be the Korean president that says no to America. Uh, and I think that was quite telling. And we, we just we don't know if and when he will ever do that. But that still um, signifies the, the the sentiments and the thinking of the progressive base. And fundamentally, their their principles and their ideology are autonomy and nationalism and and um, priority of inter Korean relations above all other relations. And so uh, I think we might see continue to see some. Um, tension in the alliance, but you have the whole coronavirus as a, as a big variable. And so uh, I think for the time being, both capitals will be so preoccupied in, in handling their own um, epidemics that it would be logistically too, and even just sheer time-wise to, to um, try to coordinate on anything, um, any big diplomatic feats. Now, perhaps on North Korea, um, if uh, there is some bandwidth uh, in the White House to focus on this, and if uh, the Trump administration thinks that um, trying to have some sort of win or progress on the North Korea front will will earn him some political points before the elections. Maybe they might try to do something, but otherwise, uh, until the November elections, I, I, I just don't see any openings for diplomacy between the US and North Korea. But that said, because the progressives won in South Korea, uh, I would expect uh, the Moon administration to at least try, even though it would be it will perhaps be practically difficult because North Korea is not a willing partner right now to, to cooperate with uh, with the South. But uh, I, could, I, can, I suspect the Moon administration will try to reinvigorate into Korean cooperation in some way, or maybe it will benefit because of uh, COVID-19. Like Myung-hyun said, you know, when North Korea needs to diversify its um, donor base uh, into, before coronav the coronavirus outbreak, the state of play between the Korean relations was as when as it relates to tourism that was just mentioned before uh, was that I was skeptical that North Korea would even want to have um, South 
Korea tour, Sapnyak South Korean tours to North Korea because if you compare the what profit it would gain compared to Chinese tourism from to North Korea, I think it would pale in comparison. And so at that time, uh, North Korea was looking for um, big uh, develop, um, donations and big investments and not just pennies. And so, but but now with uh, COVID-19 being the new twist, um, perhaps they will be open to uh, receiving South Korean aid. And South Korean aid is actually the easiest for, for North Korea to receive <laughs> any given situation. And even under conservative South Korean administration. And so they know that South Korean assistance is always a given that it's going to be there when they need it. And, you know, just like Myung-hyun said, I, you know, I, they, they've been, the North Koreans have really been um, covering their tracks and, and, and Kim Jong-un has provided himself a lot of political cover in case he needs to knock on that door, um, knock on South Korea's door. But the other political cover is, I mean, regardless of, I mean, he of course did not foresee coronavirus happening, but uh, with his, um, what was supposed to be his New Year's Day address, but with his report last December about this this year's plans, you know, he, he talked about the long confrontation with uh, the U.S. He talked about how uh, North Koreans have to tighten their belts and buckle down. It's going to be tough. The year is going to be tough. Well, he's already laid that groundwork. And so regardless of whether what the, the reasons are for some of their hardships, um, he's basically preparing North Korean minds uh, for, a, for a tough year economically and even um, on the security front. And so, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, I agree with Myung-hyun where, you know, South North Korea, even if it does formally ask the South for assistance, um, it's going to want to do it from a position of strength. So perhaps that's where some of its missile testing comes into play. Perhaps that's one objective to show that, you know, while they ask, they don't want to seem inferior to South Korea when they're asking for stuff. And so um, there are many factors here, but, uh, you know, I, I agree with what Myung-hyun said about, you know, prospects of whether it's a Biden administration or another or Trump 2.0. And yes, if it's Trump 2.0, I, for now, I do suspect uh, North Korea, I agree, uh, would um, play it a bit safe and not um, not cross Trump's red lines of ICBMs and, and nuclear tests. If it's a Biden administration, frankly, uh, I, I, you know, I, I just don't see North Korea being so eager and desperate to talk to a, in, even a Biden administration. The North Koreans are are have proven to be resilient under the harshest economic conditions. And so I think we can expect North Korea to play, you know, to, to give off the impression that they've got all the time in the world, um, that they're not desperate for talks with the U.S. Uh, but again, coronavirus is a huge twist to their calculations. So we'll have to see how they go about asking for um, aid from various um, potential donors around the world. Great. All right, we've just got a few minutes, so I'm going to shift into a, a different mode, okay? So I want you to be flexible. I didn't warn you about this beforehand. I had it in the back of my head as a possibility. So I don't know if you remember this old show from, I guess it was probably the 1980s in the U.S. called The McLaughlin Group, and it was run by this uh, old, crusty conservative guy named John McLaughlin, and he would bring on uh, four guests every time there was out of a stable of, I don't know, seven or eight, there were various, you know, journalists and, and mm. you know, government officials or whatever. And at the end of it, he would ask some very rapid fire questions. And basically you can give a yes, no answer and about a one sentence explanation. That's it. And at the end of it, I reserve the right as he did to tell you whether or not you're right or wrong. And if you say wrong, <laughs> you're Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so I got a few rapid fire questions for you so we can finish up uh, and let these uh, let these people uh, uh, not spend a, a full hour um, watching uh, watching us, although what you've had to contribute is, has of course been excellent. Um, so uh, first question, do we have uh, a decent SMA agreement signed this year that's acceptable to both parties? And is a sort of reasonable outcome. Do you on? No. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> we almost said that Go in ahead. unison. Uh, no, I yeah. agree. No. No. Okay. Uh, does the US Rock Alliance survive a second Trump presidency? Yes or no? Yes. With difficulty, uh, yes. I agree, actually, yes. But then it's going to be very different from, I mean, it's going to be just a share of what used to be. Huge daylight between the two. Okay, follow-up question. Yeah, yeah. If if Trump wins a second presidency, 
does the U.S. Rock Alliance go below the 22,000 troop threshold on the peninsula? Yes or no? Uh, no. 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 Wrong! <laughs> Wrong Trump. based on your personal opinion? Trump, oh, there was some Trump intelligence finds, about that? Trump finds a way to reduce the numbers. It's going to oh, go you below. think so? I think in oh. a second in a second Trump term, I think the U.S. troop presence goes below the congressionally mandated threshold oh, wow. of 22,000. Because all you've got to do is you've got to have a pliant uh, Secretary of Defense give a supposed reason to Congress. That's a that's a fig leaf. So that I, I disagree with oh, you on okay. that. Maybe, maybe I'm well, thinking. I guess, I guess it depends on who the Secretary of Defense will be for the next term. It's going to be an acting Secretary of Defense, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly my point. Exactly my point. He will do anything from one. Thing. Okay, so that's one question. Next question: Is Xi Jinping coming to South Korea later this year? Yes or no? Yes. Maybe. That's not a yes or no answer. Do you know? Yes or no? Oh gosh. Well, I think coronavirus is a big factor here. Okay. So, is he coming or not? Well, if, if conditions are manageable, maybe. Oh, I still have to stick with my maybe. Oh, that's just... <laughs> oh. I'll have to be the rebel. Okay. Well, yes, because, you know, because, you know, Xi Jinping, just like President Moon, is trying to project the idea that China has recovered from the pandemic and it's, you know, going back to the normal. I mean, also, right, I mean, if like in a situation, I mean, the pandemic, this global pandemic thing comes down a little bit, what's going to happen politically is that, you know, everybody, everybody indeed is going to go after China. They're going to accuse China of covering up the, uh, the pandemic and and also, you know, being like, a, you know, opaque about it and being trying to like shift blame. So what's going to happen is that China will be diplomat diplomatically ostracized a little bit, uh, you know, when things come down a little bit. So what uh, Xi Jinping will do is that in order to project uh, this image that China is still, you know, in a position of influence and trying to, you know, has like uh, everybody's listening to China right now. There, he'll come to uh, North, uh, South Korea to show that, you know, uh, China's friends, still some friends left, and also that he has recovered from the pandemic crisis. I think for the political value alone, I think China, uh, Xi Jinping will come. And this is something that Moon has been, you know, looking forward to for a long time. So he, he, has, he has no reason to say no to that. I agree. So, with yeah, so, so I agree with that. But when I said maybe, it's because of the timing. If we're saying this year, that's where I made the timing part. It's a maybe. Him visiting at all, yes, for all the reasons that Myung-Yan uh, mentions. Mm. The whole Great. geopolitical and the power posturing. Great. Last question. This year is the 50th anniversary of the nucle uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There was supposed to be, a, you know, not only the review conference, but also, you know, a celebration of this, you know, phenomenally successful treaty in many respects. Uh, obviously, I don't know how many nuclear powers there would be without the NPT, but I think it's a pretty fair guess that we would have more than the current number that we have. Nonetheless, dark clouds looming on the horizon, right? North Korea is basically, you know, an, it's a de facto nuclear power. Uh, Iran is, you know, perhaps on the threshold. Uh, there are other countries that are also threshold powers. Uh, you have the perhaps the weakening of U.S. Uh, extended deterrence in Northeast Asia, which might have knock-on effects for countries like South Korea or Japan at some point wanting to go nuclear. Does the NPT make it to 60? It's 50th anniversary this year, does it make it to 60? Or in 10 years, are we lamenting the death of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. It, it makes it or it doesn't make it? It does. It, it does. does. It does. Yeah, I think you're probably right, but just barely. Exactly, yeah. I think what's going to happen is that Right now, NPT is like an, a framework, actually an operating uh, security framework in many ways, because you know, the United States, for instance, or United Nations, essentially, is when they issue sanctions or like you know, resolutions against a country like North Korea that has violated NPT, they base their argument on the NPT argument, right? But then in 10 years' time, what's going to happen is that it's going to be less of a you know, working framework, but it's going to be more of an idea of that you know, we can all harken back to the good old days when you know countries like uh, they refrain from developing the weapons but still as an idea it's going to survive but also working framework it's going to be yeah, much less so yeah, yeah. I, you know I, I think that's right and you will have to see how uh, the discussions evolve because we are seeing some seeds or some early sprouts of you know um an evolution of discussion within the context of the MPT. So, you know, we, we see 
um, discussions like the P5 process or the creating the conditions for nuclear disarmament discussions, you know, these ad hoc groupings that have been forming uh, recently. And so, um, you know, but I think the in terms of a fundamental framework, uh, I think the MPT will always be there and be pointed to um, how effectively the MPT and the MPT MPT review conferences uh, will will operate, so that remains to be seen. But um, but I think it'll survive for another ten years. Great, thanks. Well, with that, I think we'll need to wrap up. Uh, I want to again thank uh, Dion Kim, senior advisor at the International Crisis Group, uh, responsible for Northeast Asia and nuclear policy. Thanks for coming, and also Dr. Gong Ming Hun uh, from Azan Institute, where he is a research fellow. So thank you both for joining me today. And uh, oh, my pleasure. I've Thank you so much. Conversation. You're both so intelligent, and it's always edifying to hear your thoughts. So thanks a lot, and I hope that at some point in the near future we can see each other personally. I hope so too. Okay, Sooner to. than later. Yep. Namaste. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining. <laughs>